Welcome to the Creative Baggage Podcast. I'm your host, Serena. And I'm Justin. We're here to unpack our creative baggage, share innovative ideas, and help you build a fulfilling creative career. Today's episode features a special guest. So a little bit about me. My name is Dr. Heidi K.B. Gay, and I'm an educator, flutist, podcaster, and entrepreneur. My journey is very interesting. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois, and now I'm in Dallas, Texas, two very different worlds, (laughs) but I love it. We've been in Texas now close to 14 years, my husband and I, and my husband, his name is Eric J. Begay. And he played a really huge part into the business side of what I do. And we'll get to that story later. But just a little backstory, it's myself and my husband, Eric, and our four cats. So that's a little bit about me. And yeah, I absolutely love teaching. I love performing. I love helping musicians pivot into building their own opportunities. That's amazing. Um, Can't wait to hear the love story. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, what was it like growing up in Illinois and like, you know, how, what kind of music opportunities did you have to get started? Yeah, that's a great question. So both of my parents were musicians, not oh, wow. necessarily on a professional level, but both of them really supported the arts. My mom was a pianist and an organist, and my dad was a percussionist. So I had both... <laughs> ends of the spectrum. And they really encouraged us three kids to be a part of music in some capacity. So for me, it was um, in the arts, it was ballet and flute and piano. And then my brother, it was piano and saxophone. And then my sister, it was piano and voice. And so I'm really appreciative of that support. And I'm really appreciative of that background because as you guys know, it gives you a really good foundation to then be able to grow from a starting point. And then the opportunities for me, I was really geared and focused towards uh, playing in church and serving my church and my church's congregation through worship music. So every week I was playing with um, the orchestra and the wonderful pianist at Hinsdale Baptist Church, and her name was Karis Buell. And she, I mentioned her specifically alongside Jennifer Wiggins because these women really took me under their wing and really showcased the beauty of music. They taught me how to write desk cans. They taught me how to think on my feet. You know, we could have a program, but then that morning it was, oh, quick, you know, we're going to change out this song for this song. And what an incredible experience to have at 13 years old. And so from there, I really loved music that much more. And I realized that going into my career as an adult, I wanted to serve God and my community through music. And that's where I felt most at home. And so when did you have like the realization that you wanted to major in music and and make a career out of it? Yeah. So piggybacking off of the women that I just mentioned, Karis and Jennifer, another woman in my life that was so imperative to my growth was Dr. Diane Boyd Schultz. And as you can see, I'm lighting up just saying her name because at 13, 14 years old, I went to a flute band camp in the summertime. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. Yeah. And that's where I met Diane. And that's where I also met my lifetime best friend, Afton Taylor. She's from Southern Illinois, and we've been best friends for the last 20, 30 years, which is amazing. So I went to flute band camp, and there was this impeccable uh, woman, Diane, and I just fell in love with her poise, her intellect, her uh, playing, her performing, the way she taught. And at 13 years old, I, I understood that she was somebody whom I wanted to resemble later in life. I looked at that and I remember pointing and thinking, I want to be Dr. Heidi someday. I want to resemble Dr. Diane Boyd because of the way she held herself and the way that she encouraged her students. And I wanted to be that same mentor for my own students someday. Oh, that's so cool. We had an interview with um, Stephen Clark last season 
And he's working with Diane Schultz now. So it's it's cool to see like, you know, you working with her at such a young age and him as like a full-fledged flutist working with her. And there's still so much to learn. Yeah, that's funny you say that because he and I have connected because of that connection. Wow. So we Instagrammed, messaged each other and we... We were kind of kidding, like, oh, we're flute cousins because of our <laughs> connection to Diane. <laughs> oh, That's shoot. Great. Yeah, no, there, it's always amazing to hear people's stories. It's usually like one teacher or one mentor that really makes you realize that you can do this and you really want to. I love that. Yeah. I think having such a special mentor, like what you just said, who really can bring you alongside and take you under their wing and give you that encouragement of, yes, you can do anything that you put your mind to is so powerful. It is so powerful. And then on the flip side, you can have mentors who perhaps aren't as encouraging and it can (laughs) really deflate a person. So that's another component within my career that I really try to um, hold highly, and I really take a huge responsibility for any student who comes through my door and really making sure that I give them that confidence and power so that way they can feel that, they can feel confident and, hey, I can conquer anything. Yeah, no, it's amazing you bring that up because, I mean, like, the show is called Creative Baggage. I feel like we talk a lot about the baggage that we carry with us as musicians, Um And I think a lot of it just comes from either the things that we hear repeatedly from um, friends and family who that might mean well, but, you know, you hear things over and over again, or like an early experience with a teacher or a mentor that was discouraging and you bring that negative feeling with you into adulthood, even if despite um, anything or even if everything else was encouraging and, and you've ignored you know, any of the negative comments or the negative feelings, you still, it still sits inside somewhere. So I think it's so, so important as any kind of teacher or mentor to empower your students and and not shake them down. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I love that word empowerment. Yeah. So how did you, uh, because now, you know, you run a podcast, you do coaching, you do teaching, How did you kind of get into that world from just, you were a performance major, right? So going from just, I'm going to perform on the flute, yay, to doing like four, five, six different things. Yeah, no, that's a wonderful question. And so I kind of have to take 10 10 steps back with y'all. So when I was finishing my master's, I really felt that a seed was planted on my heart for education. So I knew I was going to be a teacher, hence getting the doctorate, right? Mm. You get the doctorate if you want to teach at the collegiate level. So after my master's, I knew that, you know, remember, 13-year-old Heidi said, I want to be Dr. Heidi someday, right? So after my master's degree, I was about 24 years old, and I thought, okay, is the DMA next? But it wasn't the right time. And I was actually awarded an amazing flute studio in Texas, hence the move to Texas, and we kind of set up camp, my husband and I. And we were there for six years, and I was just waiting for the right timing to pursue that DMA if I was still going to pursue it. And sure enough, in 2014, I heard this little whisper, DMA, and clear as day, I called up my husband and I said, hey, you know, think about this, and is this the right timing? And he goes, yeah, this feels in alignment with me. So we went ahead and went to Texas Tech University in Lubbock, six hours west of Fort Worth, Texas, and I started the DMA. Fast forward uh, three years, I'm done with the program. I had started to pursue um, that academic track. And I should say, I need to drop in this little nugget right here. My Flute 360 podcast was my dissertation. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, isn't that interesting? And I, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you could okay. do that either. <laughs> yeah, and I was very, very appreciative of the support from my committee. Because as you guys know, you have to get approval of your topic before you begin such a project. So actually, I was going to go the traditional route, analyze and 
offer a performance guide, do some kind of research. And Dr. Lisa Garner Santa, the flute professor, really was like, nope, you're doing a podcast. And she said that because of her wisdom, and I'm sure she had many other reasons. But on the surface level, I knew that she knew that I liked to teach. I like to share. I like to talk. <laughs> and you put a microphone in front of me and, oh my gosh, all is lost. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love that. But, That's yeah. <laughs> but on the flip side too, she really was encouraging because there really weren't a lot of flute podcasts out there. And also, as you guys know, I don't know if you know this, Justin, but my husband is a video audio engineer. So it's like this perfect marriage. He had the tech side of things. I had the educator side of things. And all of this is to say, the point in all of this is that's what made my pivot easier. Mm. I had that background. I had that project where I thought, ooh, I have this podcast and it's going to beef up my CV under this section of publications. Academia is going to love that. They're going <laughs> to... They're going to hire me because I'm doing this creative project. And that's a, uh, a, a check, a check in that box of, yay, I'm doing publications, right? So I was adamant going towards that path of academia because that's what they teach us. And rightfully so. You know, our professors came into the world when they were going through auditions and going through school and their doctoral program 20, 30, 40 years ago, you had your two paths, playing the orchestra and or teaching academia, right? And so that's where I wanted to be, though. So that's my disclaimer. I wanted to be there. And so from 2018 to 2020, I was knocking and banging on every single door, and mm. it was a full-time job. And so 2018 to 2019, I did a year residency in Europe. I set up a performance tour in Greece, Bulgaria, Romania. I did all the things to beef up that CV so that way I could be set apart. So between the performance side and then the creative project of the podcast and the DMA, surely I'm going to get hired, right? And so in 2019, all that work paid off. I got a full-time flute position um offer, job, offer to me from this music academy outside of Shanghai, China, in a town Whoa. called Tongzong. <laughs> I know, right? So, oh, I was so excited, you guys. I was, <laughs> I was so excited because, you know, not only was I going to teach flute and music, I was going to teach piano. And not only that, but I was going to actually establish the music curriculum. The music department was brand new. They oh, were still building. that's so cool. Yeah, and I was going to put my hands onto the department and help build it from the ground up, which, as you know, Serena, I love organization. I love, you know, um, curriculums and things like that. Anyways, I digress. So I'm working on the work visa. My foot is basically on the plane. And then China called saying, guess what? The Houston embassy and the, it was the Chinese embassy in Houston and the U.S. consulate in Shanghai both shut down. You can't come over here. So Goodness. long story short, that job went away. Mm. So what do you do, right? You have to, and this is a nugget for all the listeners out there, and this is something I have to constantly remind myself, we need to be able to be adaptable and flexible, Today's music market is changing rapidly. And if we don't have that skill of adaptability, then we're going to, unfortunately, and it's okay if we do, I know I have a million times, we're going to fall flat on our face. So we need to be able to pivot quickly um, in order to succeed. So that was a long answer, but that backstory was really necessary to understand the progression of everything. Yeah, I'm and glad so, you shared. I didn't know any of this yeah. about you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of that this morning with Serena. Um, she's a UMBS intern, and we've been seeing each other and working with each other for the past six months. But I thought, oh, this is going to be a wonderful morning to actually like get to know Serena better and share these things because we've just been working, but we haven't had a chance to actually get to know each other. 
Yeah. So, yeah. But all that's to say is, so then um, last thing I'll say, and I'll wrap this up with a nice bow, and that is once that job was taken away, I had the decision. Do mm-hmm. I go back for another year? So that was 2019. That academic year was lost because now I can't apply to any other jobs. The school year has started. That job was canceled like July of August. So do I do a whole nother year of submitting my application Mm -hmm. or do I take matters into my own hands and decide what I want out of my career, what I want out of the degree? And, you know, if this is happening to anybody out there, I want to encourage you and give you this loving encouragement that you might think that you had failed, but you didn't. Do you know what I mean? By just showing up and putting your feelers out there and putting out those applications out there, kudos to you. And if the rug is pulled out from underneath your feet and you do fall flat on your face and you think, where is up? Where is down? Where am I? What an amazing opportunity to reinvent yourself. What an amazing opportunity to say, oh, let's get creative. And what can I be? What can I do with this? We are creative artists. Uh Right? (laughs) Justin and I were just kidding that like every day is a new year. New year, new me. (laughs) No. (laughs) Tomorrow is the new year from this time last year. (laughs) Oh, shoot. Yeah, I love it. So with that opportunity of being, you know, with the rug being pulled out from underneath me, it's like I really, I wanted to reinvent what was possible. I wanted to see the possibilities for my career. And so I just took what, was the traditional thing, you know, the the thing that I was building um, in the traditional sense and said, all right, let's just pivot a few degrees. I'm still a teacher. Mm-hmm. I'm still a performer. I'm still a creative artist and uh, an author and all of these things, all of these traditional hats. But just because I've decided not to use these skill sets within the traditional four walls of a university doesn't mean I'm not those things still. I'm just going to do it remotely with the people whom I choose to work with. Right. Yeah. And earlier you said that your husband played an integral role in being able to pivot and and do what you're doing now. One, I want to know how you guys met. And and two, I want to know, you know, what that process is like working with, you know, Well, it's difficult to work with anybody that you have a close relationship with, but, you know, your husband, the person you're married to. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm not going to (laughs) lie. Some days it's butterflies and rainbows and roses, and other days there are pots and pans flying across the house. So, (laughs) just being real. (laughs) Oh, shoot. Yeah, no, we met in college. It was my junior year, and it was... It was his junior year. Um, We've been married now coming into June 2023, 15 years. Uh, We knew each other three years before we got married. And that he basically is my college sweetheart. So, yeah. And then he went off to audio school for a while in Minnesota. I went off to master's in Louisiana. We got married in New Mexico. And the rest is history. So with his audio-video background and his tech side of things— When I asked him, hey, is the DMA in alignment with you for us to drop everything in Fort Worth, Texas and go and move to Lubbock, Texas, I had to ask him that because, like you said, it's a marriage. We have, you know, we're supporting each other and um, it was part his decision too. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it was a big deal was because he had just finally received, after a lot of work, a full-time audio job through a church. And so that meant leaving that financial security, that Mm -hmm. meant leaving his clients in Fort Worth, and him having to pivot and pick up and start afresh in Lubbock as well. So we said yes, he went over there, and this is what what is really cool. He started knocking on church doors and saying, hey, I was an audio-video guy for churches, and I did live sound. Nobody was hiring. And so we were both like, oh my gosh, you know, this this could be bad. But he decided to pivot and he threw on his CEO cap and said, all right, now's the perfect time to start my JK Media Productions company. 
And he started learning how to be a solopreneur. He started listening to podcasts. He started acquiring his own podcast and music clients while I was taking musicology, music theory, flute lessons. And in the background, you guys are going to love this. I get goosebumps every single time I mention this. (laughs) In the background, I'm studying Brahms and Wagner, and you guys get it. In the background, he's tweeting over here in an ear going, oh, do you know what these solopreneurs, solopreneurs are doing? Do you know like how to uh, market your classes and offerings? Do you know that they're making millions of dollars off of these courses? Oh, these podcasters, they are finding their clients through a podcast show. You mm-hmm. should start a podcast. And this was in 2015 before I graduated in 2018, where Lisa said, you should start a podcast. So he was an integral part because for three years, he was like, you should start a flute podcast. (laughs) And I was like, nobody wants to hear and listen to me. (laughs) And so, and, you know, I said too, you know, because my mind was in this traditional, uh, on this traditional road right? Mm -hmm. In this traditional sense of, I'm getting my doctorate. Why are you telling me these things? I don't need to know about podcasting. I don't need to know about business. I'm working towards this goal. And lo and behold, all of that seed planting came to good use. Because then when the China job went away, he was that integral part that said, your podcast is not anymore a CV builder. It is not a resume builder. You are not begging them for them to hire you. You're going to hire yourself, and now you're going to pivot and let that Flute 360 podcast not be built in this academia sense, but it is going to be a light that's shining Mm-hmm. onto you and who you are as a teacher and as a performer. And you're going to amplify your voice through your own stage that you've built for two years. And you're going to pivot and start using that podcast to reach the students and the clients whom you want to serve. And so that's why he, I mean, I owe him my career because he goes, Heidi, why are you putting in, in all these applications for an adjunct flute professor job, adjunct? And here in the States, they pay $800 a month. He's mm-hmm. like, why are you killing yourself to get that $800 job? And where you could be making twice as much, if not three times as much, if not four times as much over here being your own boss. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. It's incredible what like so na- some nagging can do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so true. I mean, I feel like even even creative baggage, it was like uh, my friend Bailey, my best friend from college, like just saying, hey, we should start a podcast. We should start a podcast. <laughs> we should do it. <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't really want to start a podcast. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. That's but here awesome. We are. Yeah. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> no, I would love to kind of... Um, now kind of talk about how we met, which was through the Ultimate Music Business Summit, because I saw your post on Facebook. I guess, you know, flutists, like they just kind of add each other on Facebook. I have a bunch of (laughs) flute friends on Facebook that I have never met, but like we ran in some of the same circles. And so you happened to be on my feed and I saw that you posted um, the Ultimate Music Business Summit corporate sponsorships internship. And at that moment in time, you know, Creative Baggage, we were building our database of opportunities that's now launched and and we needed to look for sponsors for it soon. You know, we had won a grant to build it and, and we spent some money on building it. But at some point we knew that like, as much as this was a passion project, if it was going to sustain itself and, and be able to continue on, we needed to have some money coming in. And so when I saw this internship, I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm helping um, another cause, but at the same time, I'm learning how to do it for myself, which is how we connected. And so it's it's been really amazing just working with such an amazing team and mm-hmm. and seeing the process of how a summit like that comes together. Mm-hmm. Um, when did you, I guess, join 
UMBS from the beginning or did you come on board a little after? I know Garrett was the one who like founded the whole thing, but yeah, when did you join the team? Yeah, that's a great question. Can I go backwards a little bit with a few nuggets that you said? Because I want to highlight the genius that came out of your mouth. (laughs) 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 And Serena knows that I think the world of her. I think you're just, you've got fantastic ideas. And the fact that you've got an amazing team just like you, Justin, your minds must be like five. I think literally what you guys are doing, you're like five, 10 years ahead of the curve. So hats off to you guys. Um, so the genius that came out of your mouth, hey, I realize I have a creative project and in order for it to be sustainable, in order for it to keep going, I'm going to need to receive an ROI. I need to get some return on my investment because you're putting money on the back end of the website fees, your time, other fees that are accrued, right? And if you don't have an income stream coming in, you can't cover your costs, which means the project goes flop, right? So bravo to you for you to be really creative and get messy and decide, okay, how can I fund this? Is it going to be patrons through Patreon? Is it going to be corporate sponsors? Is it going to be a fundraiser? Good for you. And any listener listening to this, I encourage you to do the same thing with any creative project you're getting your hands on to it. Companies want to work with you. They want to work with you. I don't care if you are this small and you feel like a small fish in a big sea, or if you are a whale and everything in between, companies want to work with you. So anyways, I just wanted to take a moment just to praise you guys for getting really creative and deciding, hey, we need to receive some sort of um, ROI or cover our costs at least, right? Mm-hmm. Anyways, the question was, as you can see, like I say, you put a microphone in front of me. <laughs> <I love that>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. But yeah, UMBS, uh, real quick with the backstory, Garrett, Dr. Garrett Hope was the founder and is the founder. And he did the first annual summit all by himself and That launched 2020. So he organized it in 2019. The annual summit started in January 2020, and he did that first go all by himself. And then he realized, oh my goodness, there's a lot involved. The presenters, the schedule, getting the sponsors, it adds up. I need a team. So then that's when he brought myself and Arthur Brewer onto the executive committee, and we worked on the second annual event for, what is that now? What year are we in? We're going into 21. That was our first year helping him. And then now we're going into the third annual summit and Arthur and I realized we need help. And so we started onboarding interns like yourself, Serena, and John as well. And so, yeah, that's a little bit of the backstory and when I came into UMBS. Cool. And and tell us, because this will be my first year attending the summit, tell us a little bit about, you know, what happened in last year's event and what were some highlights, what were some cool things that you took away from the experience? From last year? Yes. Sure. So what I really appreciate about this summit is, yes, it's virtual, but it feels very much in-person too. And I say that because of the the interactiveness between the presenters and the attendees. So yes, we're going into these virtual rooms and listening to presentations, but the majority, like 90% of the presentations that occurred last year were live. There were only a few that were actually taped and recorded. So because of that, the subjects and the topics are being presented live from these 30 amazing experts within the field. And then you get to pick their brains afterwards in a live Q&A. That was one feature that I think really resonated with me as a board member, but also as an attendee. And I think that resonated with a lot of our participants. A lot of them post-summit said, oh my goodness, yes, it was a remote event, But I felt so connected to the board, the presenters. I met and made some wonderful connections among the other participants. And 
I'm really, I'm really fortunate to be a part of it. And that was a huge highlight for me for uh, 2022. Awesome. Yeah. And, and this coming year, um, we're both going to be presenting. So that's going to be really cool. Um, I'm going to be talking about a winding career path. So kind of, you know, what do you do when you graduate from music school and you're not sure what direction to go in um, and, and you don't know what's out there for you to do, even though, you know, you're well-trained in your field and, and you are passionate about music. And so, um, yeah, I'll be giving a presentation on how to navigate and develop the skills that you need that may have been missing from music school or just, you know, find your direction through what you already know that you're good at. That's um, amazing. Yeah, yeah, we love your proposal. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have your presentation topic yet? I know right now it's written that it's about cats, but I think that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think Garrett gave me a boost of inspiration. I think it's going to be about cats. <laughs> no, a little side note about our founder and friend, Garrett. Once you get to know him, he has a sense of humor, and I really appreciate it because he gets us all giggling in, in meetings. But good question. Um, I do not know my topic yet. I think I'm going to be talking about corporate sponsorships. Actually, the first year I talked about podcasting mm. for the modern day musician. The second year I talked about building relationships and the art of networking and not networking from the sleazy standpoint, but from a standpoint of authenticity and being genuine. Mm -hmm. um, because from those interactions, inspiration unfolds. When you put people in your orbit, your creative projects come off the ground and you can oh, be definitely. creatively, right? Yeah, you can be creatively and financially fulfilled. And so starting with people is imperative. So going into the third year, I think I'm going to be talking about corporate sponsorships because actually you, Serena, have inspired me with the work that we've done for you obtaining corporate sponsorships for your database and for Creative Baggage. I had that podcasting corporate sponsorship course, um, as you know, because you watched it, but I think I want to broaden it out a little bit to start including music projects, creative projects, not just podcasting. Mm -hmm. So, because like, what are we doing right now? We are obtaining corporate sponsorships for a music business summit. Right. So those nuggets that you learned in the video are very applicable to some degree to what we're doing. And I want to teach that to other musicians because I've had harpists, clarinetists, saxophonists come to me and pick my brain on a one-to-one -one level about getting those sponsors for their creative projects, even if it's not a podcast. So anyways, I think that's what I'm going to be talking about. We shall see. <laughs> yeah. No, that's look out for the summit. Um, it's going to take place January 5th to 7th. 5th yes. to 7th. Oh, <laughs> I can't speak English anymore. <laughs> 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 it's going to take place January 5th to 7th, 2023. Um, and, and you can start getting your tickets now. We'll put a link in the description. But it's going to be an amazing event. I cannot wait. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I can't wait either. And thank you for all of your hard work and your ideas and being so diligent coming to the meetings and I know Garrett and Arthur and I really appreciate the way you think. We really appreciate your ideas. And I've learned a lot from you. And that's why we do what we do. I love mentoring. And, you know, Serena, you and I were kind of giggling about this a couple months ago, right? <laughs> Serena and I, for the listeners who care to know, we wear all these different hats within our relationship. We've become friends. I've become a sponsor for her project She's an intern for UMBS. I'm mentoring her through the video. But then at the same time, even though she's an intern for us, you're not just an intern. And even though I'm mentoring you, I'm learning so much from you. And it's reciprocated, right? And the ideas and the creativity and the amazingness that you bring to the table, I'm like, huh, 
I would have never thought of it like that before. And you're just getting the wheels in my head turning. And so I want to thank you for your contribution because it really is mind blowing to me. And that's why I love being a mentor, an educator, a creator with my colleagues and peers and friends. Oh, that means a lot. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I remember that Zoom call where you were like, okay, so which hat should I wear first? (laughs) Do you want like, do you want like encouraging Heidi? Do you want like, you know, like constructive criticism? (laughs) Do you want me to pretend to be like, you know, a company? Or do you want me to like be your friend? And I was like, all right, we're going to start with the nice stuff and then we're going to go into this and then we're going to go to that. But it is, it is so true. I mean, I love what you said about, um, you know, your previous presentation about networking and making these connections, because you really, you know, just by seeing the behind the scenes of another project or another person's, you know, creative process, like you, I feel like we don't necessarily consciously think about it, but subconsciously we pick up so much from what another person is doing or the way that they work on things. And I've done this so many times with Creative Baggage where, you know, because I also wear a lot of hats. I do a lot of freelance stuff um, and I I like to be part of different projects, even non-musical ones. So like I might see, and we're going to have um, my friend Charlie on later who who teaches French online and, and he runs Street French, which is like a big um, online uh, platform, I guess, for learning French. But I do like some of his graphic work for his e-course and I, I helped him build his newsletter and stuff like that. And then I was like, oh yeah, like some of the copy or the ways that he's working on his newsletter could really work for us. Um, or like when I did some volunteer work for the Green Consumer Project, which is all about sustainable fashion, seeing the way that they ran their team and put together their organization on Slack and how their workflow um, happened between so many people and so many young people too, who, you know, don't have experience working like jobs where they have to be on time and, and doing like fulfilling responsibilities outside of school to see how they're able to manage each other and work together as peers, I think, um, helped me understand what it means to set up a good system to work with a team, even though our team is much smaller, you know, it's only three people, but having a good workflow, even for yourself, um, you know, being the most efficient that you can be is really important so that you're not wasting time doing tasks that could be done in a, in a better way, a more effective way. Um, so it is really cool when you make connections, whether it is with people that are directly in your field and you know can help you in some way, or just learning from somebody else's process, it never hurts. Like knowing more people, Being friends with more people, getting to know, like, getting to understand more people and getting that connection, like, it's only going to be a good thing in your life. Oh, yeah. 110%. I completely agree. Everything is connected. Everything is connected. The way Eric does, and I'm sure, Justin, you can talk about this, the way he constructs and deconstructs audio, there is an art and a science to it. And the way he listens as a musician really comes in handy being an audio engineer. And him being married to a flutist, he now has a different sense of ears and scope when it comes to listening for tone of the instrument coming through the microphone and into the recording. Do you know what I mean? So everything's connected. And you could be in a business call, like I'm working right now with a sales uh, slash marketing agency for a flute shop. And the meetings every Wednesday morning just blow my mind. They are just spitting out all this information about SEO and analytics and the background of websites and the algorithms. And you know what I mean? And it's mm-hmm. like, oh, hmm, that kind of <laughs> how come in handy. So I loved what you said, and I completely agree. Everything is connected. And so if you can get messy in these other fields, whether it's science or being an engineer or whatever field, you know, tickles your fancy, 
kind of go there and, and just be in there. You don't have to be a full out artist, you know, like a, maybe a sculptor or a painter if you don't want to be. But as a musician, maybe dabble in that area for a while or dabble in business or dabble in because you can learn a nugget or a gem from that world and bring it into your world. And then you could just have this big aha moment. Right. And especially because a lot of the times in school, our focus is on just, you know, playing flute and playing well. And and so there is a little bit of a, a gap in, in our knowledge. And so I think it's even more crucial to be able to fill in those gaps. You know, for the moment, I really hope that you, the way that academia treats other subjects, um, even as music majors, will change. But for the moment, since we have so many musicians graduating from music school and going out into the real world, I think the best way to develop those skills is from talking to people and trying to find opportunities and experiences for yourself. Because even now, like, I don't have any kind of formal training in business, but I feel like I'm so much more competent in these business-related skills because I've taken opportunities that are related and I've spoken with people who know what they're doing, either from their own formal training or just figuring it out for themselves. And, and you know, figuring it out for yourself can sometimes be even more fulfilling and more, like, it, you could find a way that works even better for you than just whatever it is that a traditional person would learn in business school, for example. Yep. You can read books all day long. And I'm not discrediting books and business books. No, I screw books. Pro- <laughs> I don't read. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, yeah. Well, so I'm not discrediting books and what you can learn from them, but there is something with action and taking action. And I don't have a business degree. I didn't know I was going to be a businesswoman, but right now I'm running two businesses, actually three businesses. Mm -hmm. I have the Pivoting Musician with Garrett, and that actually organically flourished from our relationship through UMBS. So he and I wear multiple different hats together. We just got our LLC in the mail. I have 360, and I have JK Media Productions. I'm the CEO of three different businesses. I didn't go to business school, but I'm doing it because I'm a little crazy, and that's... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that's what life uh, threw my way. And I'm so happy for that opportunity because actually, you know, at first, and now we're going down a whole nother rabbit hole, and I swear I won't be here long. You know, <laughs> speaking of life giving you these opportunities, I wouldn't have it any other way. Actually, you know, when I was pivoting, I thought, oh my gosh, my identity in academia is gone. I failed. I'm not going to feel satisfied at all. The doctorate holds no weight. What did I do for 20 years getting that title, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm being blatantly honest. And then as I was building my business, I had to get creative in thinking about how do I create this course? How do I construct it? How do I get people enrolled? Because as you guys know, you can shout out from the rooftops all day long, hey, I had this thing. But getting people actually through the door is a whole nother thing. That's an art in of itself, Mm -hmm. right? And the more I was building these courses and onboarding clients, et cetera, et cetera, I told Garrett this in a very candid conversation one day. And I said, and I looked at him and I said, actually, now the doctorate feels like it has even more weight. It doesn't, yeah, because I... That title gives you, or you don't even need that title. Nobody needs to give you permission. But it almost like when you have a terminal degree, they're saying, the Institute is saying, go out into the world and research and form new ideas and create new things. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And because I was doing that and I was actually getting my hands really messy, and I'm not bashing anyone who's in academia teaching music appreciation from a book, but that's what I would have done. I would have taught, I would have gone to the school to be Dr. Begay, teaching theory and history and flute. And I would have been opening up the book, chapter one, this is, you know, these are medieval chants. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But because life unfolded the way it did, it made me feel like my doctorate had more weight and more validity because 
I got messy. I got really messy and I had to get creative. And yeah, I'm just, I could go on and on, but I'm just so thankful for that opportunity. And I just wanted to share that. No, yeah. I mean, okay, one last direction to take this conversation in, because I love what you said about the kind of question or crisis of identity as a musician, because there is kind of this one way of thinking about making it in music that we're fed from a very, very young age. And so I think even people who want to be creative and want to branch out, um, and I would include myself in this, you know, I I want to do projects beyond just playing the same like traditional classical repertoire for the rest of my life. But I like wrestle with those parts of my identity because at the core, the message that we've been taught for so long is that in order to be a successful or like a true classical flutist, you have to go down that one core path, the straightforward, like get an orchestra job, become a professor, do all, like get all the milestones, do all the markers. And and I think that maybe it can't be changed in terms of like how we will get stuck feeling about it every once in a while, just because of the years and years of baggage in that arena. But I think like it is kind of our job to find other paths that are accepted within our field and sustainable and and reasonable to do and, and ways that everybody who goes through music school and wants to become a musician can be able to pursue their passion and and still build a career for themselves and not get stuck in either you win an orchestra job and you've made it or you failed, you know? Like, I think Mm -hmm. that we need to open up more paths and more ways of of succeeding for people. So I think this is like a really, really, really important topic to be discussing and Mm -hmm. to hear your story of identity, even though like, you know, now I would have never known anything about your past and how you felt about that part of your past because it you seem like you know a, a different person you seem like oh you know I've got all these businesses I'm doing my thing I have my podcast and yet there was like a point that you had to decide that I have to let go of what my identity was and I think a lot of people grapple with that I'm grappling with it now mm. and um you know I don't think you can go through a music school and not have that identi- identity crisis at some point. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So much wisdom there. And I love it. You're right. We need to be having these conversations more and we need to be open-minded to the other possibilities. And I think without sounding like a Debbie Downer, I don't even know if you can apply that here, but I'm going to go with it. I think our market and the way it's pivoting, it's going to require us to actually make those pivots and to wear those different hats and get messy. It's not going to be just a, oh, we should consider, musicians should consider these different hats and different paths. Yes, but I think we're going to be lovingly forced to wear these different hats. It's it's inevitable. I mean, literally going back to the beginning of our conversation, our music professors graduated in a completely different market than where we are now, Mm -hmm. right? And if we don't learn, there's not enough jobs to go around. The market is overly saturated with highly qualified musicians and not enough jobs to go around. So if you think of this pie, we're trying to shove thousands of music graduates into a one to 2% (laughs) sliver. No, that is what it is. Isn't it? it? (laughs) I'm sorry, but that's insanity. That is insane. What about the other 98% of the pie? Right. There is enough pie to go around. And it's just mind-blowing to me that we still teach our kids, and I think there are some music programs out there that are pivoting, and hats off to them, giving their students these music business entrepreneurial skills in their wheelhouse in order to be successful in the modern day, not mm-hmm. not 40 years ago, right? Um, so I think we need to realize that there's enough pie to go around and what part of that 98% do I fit in? Mm-hmm. 
there's enough opportunities there, you know, and notice the breadcrumbs, your path as a flutist and my path as a flutist. And I apologize, Justin, what's your main instrument? A saxophone. Awesome. Saxophone. Your path as a saxophonist is going to look completely different because there are, there's so much room for opportunities and your breadcrumbs, Serena, and my breadcrumbs, they're going to be different. Like, um, just again, like noticing the breadcrumbs for my life, bringing a full circle within our whole conversation. I had an audio video engineer husband. I like to teach. I like to serve God through the church with my music. I like to, do you know what I'm saying? And you have these little breadcrumbs and then you start putting it together and you're like, oh, wow, I've got a sustainable, substantial career here that doesn't look like anybody else's. And how amazing is that? And I think it's, it's an amazing reflection of who we are as individuals. We are all a unique thumbprint, right? And to then have your career reflect that uniqueness of what you bring to the table, I think it's just, it's just you know, amazing. Um, so anyways, that's a whole nother <laughs> yeah, I feel episode, like you, isn't it? <laughs> you just gave my UMBS presentation for me. <laughs> Perfect. Done. We'll just replay Done. that. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I think you would do it far better justice than what I just did. But um, yeah, and I'm so glad that you guys are having these conversations with your friends and peers and mentors through your podcast. I wish there were more Justins and Serenas out there doing what you're doing. And that's why I, when you reached out, Serena, and said, hey, I want to be a UMBS intern, I was, you know, this social media stalker checking you out and things like that. I'm like, oh, <laughs> right? Don't we all do that? <laughs> yeah. um, I was just like, oh my gosh, this girl and her team, she is blowing my mind. And I'm like, I hope she takes this internship. I hope she takes this internship because I want to um, clone in a good way. I just said we are all unique thumbprints. I want to <laughs> I want to clone you and Justin to the umpteenth degree because you guys are the voice of the next generation. And I think these conversations have to be had because if not, we're going to have a catastrophic situation where, like we said, there's all these music graduates and not enough jobs. Right. And I'm sorry, I'm not okay with that. We've all, we all have invested thousands of dollars, hours, time, Mm -hmm. buying instruments, music, and there are so many talented musicians out there, and they, get, they can easily get so discouraged of, why am I not good enough? Because I don't fit the mold of one of those two jobs. It has right. nothing to do with that. Anyways, I'm rambling, but it's just, it's so encouraging to hear you guys have those conversations because it's needed. And I think we, I think life is beautiful, and I think, you know, having the courage and the willpower to forge a new path isn't always easy, but it is completely possible. Yeah. No, they're, they're hard conversations to have. I think, you, you know, sometimes I think it could be triggering to hear like, oh, I worked so hard for this and there are not enough jobs out there. And nobody wants to feel like, you know, I'm not going to be the one to win one of the few jobs that there are. But I read this really cool article. I think it was coming out of Finland, um, you know, professors in music schools doing research on how we can make the field like sustainable and lucrative for the future and saying that like, you know, we do have to teach people to let go of this traditional route. And, And my own take on that is that like, that doesn't mean you like we're teaching people to let go of their dreams, you know, like lots of people really just want to play an orchestra and that's their passion or they want to teach at the collegiate level and there's no doubt that there are people that are beyond passionate about doing exactly that. But I think it is about, you know, having something meaningful that you can do while you're working on it. Yes. Like, first of all, you know, it, it takes years to get an orchestra job. If you don't get one right out of school, what are you going to do for the next decade, maybe, that it might take you to win your dream job? Um, you could, you know, the options out there now are not, really appealing and that causes a lot of people to stop doing what they're doing even if if they continued maybe they would win that job one day 
And the other part of it is that our goals change. And, you know, what I wanted to do when I was in seventh grade is not the same as what I want to do now because I have a different perspective. My life has changed. And I also have developed new interests or even brought back interests that I had as a kid that I let go of because I was like, I'm going to focus on the flute. And so I, I think that's kind of the brighter way of looking at it is that we're trying to make it more possible for people to stay in this field for whatever reason that they have, whatever motivation that they have to continue on, whether it is to eventually go back and do the traditional thing or to build something completely new that no one even knew was an option to begin with. Ooh, I love that. So yes, you can pivot into being the CEO of a company while you are, if you your if your heart is steadfast on that academic role, what can we do until that goal is reached? If you are so gun ho about it, right? And I have thought of that. I thought, oh, is this business thing just temporary while I find that position in academia? I've I've entertained that idea for a half a second and where I am right <laughs> now. <Yeah. laughs> Where I am right now, I am genuinely satisfied. Right. I, in this season, I don't see myself applying to academic jobs within the next two to three years. Maybe I'll re, I'll come across, you know, this idea later and consider it, you know, down the path. But honestly, there was a job, a flute position posted in, um, Plano, Texas, last month, uh, another one posted in another part of the country. And for a half a second, I thought, ooh, should I apply? And I looked at the application, and I was like, nope, I have no desire. So while you are, what, like what Serena said, right? If you really are gun ho about that one goal, orchestra, academia, hats off to you. I think having that drive and focus is so imperative to reaching that goal. Build something at, to sustain you until you reach that goal. But don't be surprised that the thing that right. you're building while you wait is actually your real calling. Right. No, I, I think that's absolutely true. And just knowing that things can change at any point, right? Like now you're like, oh, you know, I don't really want this position. Who knows in 20 years, maybe you, yeah. you got to take care of your cats. <laughs> <laughs> and you just you just want to be able to show up to work every day and and not think about work once you know like you can have your your work life balance or whatever that we probably don't have at all right now but yeah. <laughs> things change you know and and I think right. that that's something that I had to learn because I held on to for so long like 7th grade Serena's dreams which weren't even grounded in reality <laughs> And honestly, I was thinking the other day, and, and Justin and I have reflected on this, like if I were to go back and, and talk to like my seventh grade self and tell her that, you know, I'm in France, I'm doing something entrepreneurial, I'm like, you know, trying to help other musicians and artists and, and make changes in our field, and I'm still playing the flute and going to school, like I would have just, my brain would have exploded. I didn't like, <laughs> I didn't think I would leave the country or like, do any of this. So yeah, I, I think it's it's almost impossible to really make a plan of what you're going to do in the future. Yeah. Yeah. No, I com you can have, I think a mentor told me once, if I'm saying this correctly, you can make all the plans you want, but just make those plans in pencil with a big eraser on it. And that just taught me Again, going back to the head of this conversation, you need to be flexible. You need to be adaptable. We can make these plans, but life is kind of funny, isn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah. And you can find yourself in a completely new territory and you're looking around and feeling like Lewis and Clark. Like, oh my goodness, <laughs> where's my Sacagawea? I need someone to guide me here because I did not realize I was going to be in this place. But that's the beauty. That's where the beauty is. You know, going back to seventh grade Heidi, since you brought that up, I envisioned someday I would have loved to have worked. And I remember envisioning this. I wanted to work with my husband someday. Going back to the question that I think I never answered <laughs> <laughs> earlier, how, what, is, what is it like to work with your partner? Um, I envisioned him and I both being music professors at the college. 
we're working together, but over here as digital entrepreneurs. So if my seventh grade self could see Heidi and Eric and what we're doing now, it's like mind blowing. It's like, what? I get to work from home with my four cats and (laughs) my husband is on the other side of the wall and we get to connect with musicians in Paris and in Lincoln, Nebraska and Oregon and Australia and New Zealand. Like, pinch me. How cool is that, you know? So, yeah, be open to those possibilities because if we, it's good to have those goals, right? But if we are so stubborn, and I know this is speaking from my my life and my perspective, I was so stubborn. I was holding onto those reins so hard and those blinders were tight. Um, and it's good to a certain degree, but I think there needs to be some fluidity and there needs to be some uh, movement within your blinders, again, to notice those breadcrumbs, because I think it can be unhealthy if it's too focused. Mm -hmm. And then, because you won't notice the opportunities that are around you. Yeah, just being perceptive, I think, is the Mm. other key. Just, you know, there are a lot of things that pop up that we don't see because we're looking in a different direction. And if you just go in whatever direction comes up, it's, yeah, it's like riding the current instead of swimming against it. Yeah. <laughs> Boom, you nailed that. Yes, 100%. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming um, on our podcast. And I can't wait to talk to you on Flute 360. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait either. <laughs> but yeah, so UMBS, if, um, for our listeners out there, UMBS, the Ultimate Music Business Summit, is going to happen January 5th to 7th, 2023. And we can't wait to see you there. Yeah. And you can go to musicsummit.biz. And if you want to reach out and pick my brain, if there's anything in all of this mess that I said that resonates with you, you as a listener can go to my website at heidikbegay.com. And I would love to start up a relationship with you. And Justin and Serena, I cannot thank you enough for letting me ramble your ear off for an hour. Thank you so much for your uh, graciousness and being such amazing hosts. So thank you for having me. Yeah. Oh, you're such a delight. That's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's so crazy that I didn't know like so much of your story. You know, like I know about the stuff that you're doing right now, but I knew nothing about, you know, how you got here. So... I'm so glad that we got to do this. If you're feeling inspired to take on new creative opportunities, check out our database of scholarships, grants, internships, and jobs at forthelostcreative.com. We've been working hard to build this resource for you, and we hope it makes finding your creative career path just a little less daunting.